And we need to take a look at the crucifixion about Christ going to the cross. I want to start with uh, an anecdote, a quick one, that I remember when I was a teenage guy. So I share, I'm going to share it with you right now. The man who taught me athletics also was my math teacher. Now, it could be argued that he failed at factoring. That wasn't his fault. He was a good teacher. I just struggled with factoring for a while, and then finally it started to make sense. And uh, as I got older, it just made sense. But he was a good math teacher. He was a good basketball coach. I appreciate him. But around my junior or senior year in high school, I realized he was a good preacher. Uh, Coach Coker knew the Bible well. He loved the Lord, um, loved his family, served the Lord with gladness. Uh, He was a go-getter. He was very kind to me, very patient with me. I thank God for him. And I remember one chapel service when he was preaching from the Gospels, and he brought a sermon entitled, What Think Ye? Of Christ. And I would like to borrow that title this morning. It's a great question. In fact, you don't need to turn there, but I'm going to flip back. You stay in Mark 15. I'm going to go back to Matthew 22, which is the text where Coach Coker got that question. It was Jesus himself. I'm going to read it from Matthew chapter 22. Here's what Jesus said in verse 41. The Bible says, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Jesus gave them his final stump, and he won. They did not believe in Jesus as the Christ, and Jesus even befuddled them with the prophecy question here about David and Jesus being from the line of David, which we as believers understand. It was a fulfillment of prophecy, but the Pharisees in their wicked heart of unbelief were stumped. And it began with that question. What think ye of Christ? So he's asking the whole crowd of Pharisees, what do you think of the Christ? Ultimately, he was asking them, what do you think of me? They didn't answer. But could I ask you this morning as a believer, what do you, and I'll change the pronoun there, what do you think of Christ? I want to ask myself, what do I think of Christ? This morning as we look at Mark 15, I just want to point out, go ahead and tell you where I'm headed. I want to point out four different individuals in this this time of Jesus going to the cross. What each person who played party in the crucifixion thought of Christ. So let's look at Mark 15. I want to read it. I have a little bit of time. It's a great story, so I think it'll captivate us. So let's read it. Mark 15, the Bible says, And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered, said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people, that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye then that I should, shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus, 
when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed them with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon it about his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, that explains that statement, and worshipped him, of course. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, and came, went in boldly unto Pilate, and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead, and when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. I, church family, I took time to read the whole chapter because this really is the, the crucible, the crux of all human history. Mankind murdered the Son of God. But of course, as we know from Galatians and many, many other passages, he was born to die. He came for this purpose, and so Proctor provided salvation for all of us even today as we sit here. So it's a chapter well worthy reading. And so this morning, I ask that question again, what do you think of Christ? I think it's a great question for us to reflect on even as believers, because since we know him as Savior, when we answer that question, whatever that answer may be, it will give us the impetus, the motivation to be true disciples of him. So what think ye of Christ is the question. In Mark 15, look, let's look at four different people in this saga, in this story of Christ's crucifixion and find out what they thought of Christ and so compare ourselves and learn from that. The first person I would like to point out or group would be the chief priests, the elders, scribes, and we could even say the temple guard whom arrested Jesus there in the first part of the chapter, it says, And straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation. 
The King James Bible's words are so good. They give us a lot of color and a lot of, uh, I don't know, it helps your imagination. It really does. So they held a council. They had this consultation among themselves, right, with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. They got together after they had got together and got together and got together many times before. Well, this was the final consultation, get together, so that they could fulfill their murderous heart to get rid of Jesus. If you read down in Mark 15, look at verse 10, please. This was Pilate's knowledge, I will point out. Speaking of Pilate, said, For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for, what's the word? Envy. Envy. Now, we know if envy seeds in the heart and it stays there, it's going to grow to a point where it's going to produce hate. And we know if we hate our brother in our heart, God said in his eyes, this is the same as if you'd already murdered him. Think of Cain and Abel. Now, the murderous act is different, but envy or hatred in the heart will lead to murder. Isn't that what the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees did? Here they murdered the Son of God for envy, the Bible says. Even Pilate, lost Pilate, understood these guys have no justice in their heart. They've given me this man. I've examined him some. They've given him to me for envy. They can't stand him. They hate him. So I would like to answer that question, what think ye of Christ? First of all, we have a group of men here, some hate. What do they think of Christ? They hate him. Christian friend, you're always going to rub shoulders at times or come across people who hate God. They're people that have believed the lie and they've come to a point where they've believed that lie and believed that lie and they've actually thrown in with the enemy. And they hate God. They hate Christ. So you bring up Christ, you bring up God, you've met Him. They don't want to hear it. I encourage you, pray for them, try to preach to them, but then move on. The scribes and the Pharisees and perhaps many of the elders, uh, although we don't know each and every individual heart in this consultation, in this council, but they hated Christ because their words and their actions led to His crucifixion. We can see that. What think ye of Christ some hate? Let me mention a second person this morning who answered that question. Uh, and that's the man Pilate. So when we ask the question, what think ye of Christ? Some question. Some people will question. That's what Pilate did. Now, ultimately, he made his decision, but initially we see a man who was constantly questioned. In fact, he asked the most questions in the whole chapter. And if you look at parallel passages like in Matthew, you'll see that Pilate even asked more questions. If you get the perspective of the other gospel writers, you'll find out Pilate is constantly asking questions. Now, I get a sense that maybe it's because he does not know what to do. He's stalling. He has not fully answered in his own heart who this is before him. Eventually he does, so he questions. Look at Mark 15, verse 6. I'd like to begin reading there. The Bible says, Now at that feast he released, that's Pilate, unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And if you go down to verse 8, it says that this was a unique event, is the way I see it, my opinion, okay? My interpretation of verse 8 would be, And the multitude cried aloud, began crying aloud, began to desire him, that's to desire Pilate, to do as he had ever done unto them. What? You want me to release Barabbas unto you? This guy was an insurrectionist, okay? He was a robber, the Bible said. This guy's murderous. He committed murder. You're going to have me just turn him loose among you? Their answer was yes. Yeah. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Odd request, isn't it? I think that's what verse 8 is describing. They desired him, Pilate, to do as he had ever done unto him. Verse 9, but Pilate answered them and said, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? There's his first question. Or at least in this, this lesson here, the first question I pick. Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Pilate did have authority. They could have said, yes. They could have changed their mind. Yes, release him. They did not. Verse 10, we read, look at with me in verse 11. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, will, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? Notice that Pilate keeps using this title. I think that's very appropriate. 
He's making them eat their own words. Or maybe we could say he's pointing out to them that he is of you and he claims to be your king. Maybe we could say that. What will I do unto the king of the Jews? But you and I both know that it's absolute fact regardless of what anyone in the situation believes. Jesus is king and they had a decision to make and Pilate asked them a question. You know, Pilate kept asking questions in John 18. He even says, what is truth between him and Jesus? Do you remember that? If you read the parallel passage, you're going to find out Pilate is constantly questioning. You know, some, when they think of this question, what think ye of Christ, they answer it with a question. They question a lot of things. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't give up on people like that. You know, as a soul winner, that's a perfect opportunity to sow seed into water. Some people naturally have a lot of questions. They have a sharp mind. God's blessed them with a lot of intelligence. And if they haven't grown up in the truth and they are on a path of learning truth. Have you ever noticed a lot of people that are called truthers nowadays because they don't believe, you know, history as it's written by the winners and some of the things that have been proposed as hypotheses, which are really not fact, but it's been taught as fact for many years. You go back and dig, you find some first or primary sources, you realize, hey, this didn't exactly go the way we all the history books say. A lot of folks who dig into those things because they desire the truth and want to know the truth. They end up with that title. They're called truthers. They may or may not be believers in Christ, but they're called truthers because they have a heart to know, is this really what took place? They want to know the facts. Don't give me the emotion. Don't give me your perspective yet. Just tell me the facts. I want to know the facts. I feel like at the beginning here, Pilate wanted to know the facts. Uh, he claims to be your king. Shall I crucify him? We have no king but... Amen. And then they said, those who hate, we have no king but Caesar. So the lines have been drawn. <clears throat> Some question. I think questions are good, but we want to answer them with the Scripture. We want to answer them with the truth. Pilate, I think, asked the right question. He said, what is truth? And we know the answer stood right before him, before his very eyes. At that point, the question would be, what think you of Christ? Will you believe on him? Even his wife warned Pilate. All his questions couldn't save him. He needed to believe in Christ. So for those that question church member, fellow Christian, don't give up on him. Keep answering their questions with the truth and let those seeds of the truth sink into the heart. You got family members, you got coworkers, you got people you've been preaching to for quite some time. If they're still sincerely asking questions, keep answering those questions. All the more reason to study the Bible more thoroughly for me and for you, right? So that we might have uh, Pastor, what do you call it? It's like ammunition, right? Us guys, when we talk about farms, you know, when you give people verses that you can quote to them that are direct answers to their questions. You know, it's like ammo. It's like hitting a target, you know? The Word of God is powerful, right? It's like an unto a sword, another weapon. It does its job of cutting, divides the heart, answers those questions. So, what think ye of Christ? Some's answer they hate. What think ye of Christ? Some question. Can I give you a third person in Mark 15 here that we can learn from? That's the Roman soldiers. You ever thought about them? Let me point out right away, because he's on my mind, if you go to the end of Mark 15, jump there with me. We'll go back to the beginning in just a moment. But if you go to the end, there was a soldier who said, surely this is, verse 39, and when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he cried, so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. I can't help but wonder if that soldier was in the crowd that mocked when they first took Christ, when Pilate gave the command and stripped Christ and put the purple robe on him and the crown on his head and smote him with the reed and spit upon him and punched him and mocked him. False worship, getting down on their knees and mocking God. Now perhaps there were some men in that crowd that joined in and didn't give careful heed or thought to the fact that maybe they were making a grave error. I wonder if this soldier here was one of them. You know, I wonder if he was in that group of soldiers that beat Jesus. And he was the man that observed Jesus die and give up the ghosts. You tend to think he changed his mind. Surely this was the Son of God. So, 
some mock. Some mock. Mark 15, 16, it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. When you read that phrase, and they called together the whole band, you get a very, uh, I guess, a premonition there. You're, you're reading along, and you're like, this is not going to be good. Hey, guys, get over here. Look at this. We got some work to do. And you see that spirit of mocking come in to the Romans' process of beating a, a condemned criminal. This was fun for them, unfortunately. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with the reed and did spit upon him. So if the crown of thorns was already upon his head and they smote him on the reed, the reed would have just driven that into his crown further. And bowing their knees, worshipped him. Oh, if they only knew. Folks, we have to think about this for a minute. This is a really sober thought here. Bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, the next verse, verse 20, they took off the purple from him and put on his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Maybe we could say this, it would have been better for them to change their mind and leave the purple robe on him and say, oh, forgive me, I have made a great error. You're worthy of the color. You're worthy of a robe far beyond this. Have mercy on me. We see that in the thief on the cross who changed his mind. Would to God all the soldiers that mocked would have changed their minds. Perhaps that one did at the end of Mark 15. I'm hopeful for him. He gives me hope. And when we see people question and we give them answers and we see them thinking about the truth, when we give that question, what think you of Christ? and we see them process in truth, we ought to have great hope for them because we know the Holy Spirit's teaching them. We know the Holy Spirit will use the truth in their heart and in their life. Some mock. Some hate, some question, some mock. Can I give you a fourth one this morning as we move along quickly? <clears throat> this is the good news. Some believe. Do you realize that? Some believe. Yea, many believe. And this is a great thing. Mark 15, verse 21, I want to pick up there. The story goes, And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now you have to understand, I imagine this man was very, very nervous because <clears throat> he's just been commanded by Roman soldiers to pick up a wooden cross and bear it for a condemned criminal. I wonder if in his mind, I don't know his heart and his mind, the Bible doesn't necessarily give us insight into that, if you know of otherwise, please tell me. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But I wonder if Simon's heart fills with fear if he realized if I'm not careful here, I might, if I'm not careful here, I might end up with the same condemnation. But do we realize he already had the same condemnation? We are all condemned in our sins, condemned to die and worthy of hell. But Christ was going to the cross to pay for Simon's sins too. And Simon would just play a role in bearing his cross. I can't help but wonder, did Simon believe? As he took that heavy wooden cross up the way to Golgotha, which is a skull, the place of a skull because of how it looked, I wonder if he thought, was, it, was his mind just on the pain of the weight of that cross and the fear of what might happen to him if they didn't turn him loose once he finished the job that he was compelled to do to get the cross up to its position? All those emotions swarming around in his head as just a regular man. I wonder if there came a point where he began to think, who is this man that I'm carrying the cross for? Is he just a man? Or is this man condemned unworthily? Surely Simon had heard of all the things that Jesus had done too. I mean, the Bible even names who his sons were. He was obviously known by some of the people in the crowd. The Romans... Felt like they could ask him to help. I wonder, was he a strong man? Was he a powerful man? Was he a man that worked among them in that, that zone? Whatever, he was told to carry the cross of Jesus. I'm kind of hopeful for him, so maybe we could take Simon, the Cyrenian, and put him in the category of some believe. We don't know that. It'd be an argument from silence, perhaps. But he did carry Jesus' cross. And I wonder if he had the same conclusion as the Roman soldier. Surely this was. The Son of God. 
Perhaps he believed. But nevertheless, we move on. The Bible says in verse 22, And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. I just put a note here. Jesus chose the full suffering. He had already been through Gethsemane. He had already determined he would obey the Father. He knew it was for this purpose that he had come. He taught the disciples that. All four Gospels testify of it. Jesus fully paid for all of our sin. He fulfilled every prophecy. Men have searched the Scriptures for decades, centuries even, thousands of years now, and you will find that the conclusion is the same. All that the prophets foretold was and is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. And we get to look back on that, and we get to rejoice in that, and we get to reap the benefits of that, of being able to show others, hey, you can trust the Bible. It's true. Search the Scriptures. For they are they which testify of me, Jesus said in the book of John. That's what he told the Pharisees. He said, you do err. He's like, search the Scriptures. They're telling you, I'm the Christ. My Father bears witness. The Scriptures bear witness. My deeds and my miracles bear witness. But if you don't believe me, believe the deeds. Right. What think ye of Christ? Some believe. Some believe. That's great news. You have believed, right? Amen. You know that He's God in the flesh who paid for all of your sins and gave you eternal life because you simply chose to believe in what He did for you on the cross, not just for the sins of the whole world, but for you, for me, for your sins, for my sins. We should think about that often. Some believe. We should read on. And when they had crucified Him, they parted His garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified Him. So we get a sense Jesus was on the cross physically and literally for three hours or more. And the superscription of His accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Is it an accusation? Or is it just the cold, hard facts? It's just the truth, amen? He's not only the king of the Jews. He is king of kings. I mentioned, a, um, maybe it was pastor, a couple of men in the church one time. I'm intrigued by a statement in Revelation that says that Jesus is the prince of all the kings of the earth. And I kept scratching my head for the longest. I'm like, why would the Bible, why would the eternal words of God call Jesus a prince? Well, if a man is a king and he has a son by birth, what does that automatically mean? It's all his. The prince owns everything just as much as dad. It's his, guaranteed, by birth. So when dad moves out of the picture... Instantly. That's right. Jesus is the prince of all the kings. of the Every man who's ever had authority, who's ever lived, is a sinner. And though he owns great possession, Jesus owns everything that was his because as creator he gave it to him to begin with. He's the prince of the kings of all the earth. Here he's king of the Jews. We know ultimately he's king of kings. So he's king, 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 thrice king. There is no argument about it. Jesus was man, but Jesus was God. And God died on that cross there that day. And those wicked men put him there. But even while he was dying, he was literally paying for the sins that they were committing against him. Folks, it's a great story. We should tell everyone. We should tell them about Mark 15. Some believe. Let me finish up here. And it was the third hour they crucified him. That's verse 25. We read that. Jesus died on the cross. He didn't swoon. It wasn't just, there's all kind of ridiculous theories about there that go fly in the face of plain scripture. So don't get sucked into that. You'll read it in commentaries. You'll read it in blogs. It's a bunch of bunk designed to minimize the fact that Jesus died, fulfilled prophecy, and paid for every sin. That's what he did. That's what the Bible says he did. Read with me verse 27. And with him they crucified two thieves. And this is my final thought this morning. The one on his right hand and the other on his left. Again, a, a scripture or a prophecy fulfilled. That's what verse 28 says. So I will read that also. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Let me point this out. Thief on each side, right? 
it says they, the two, railed on him. Wait a second. I thought one thief was believing and one was unbelieving. A great picture of the Bible word repent. Do you realize there was a thief that railed and then changed his mind? You say, how do you know that, Chad? You don't have to go there, but if you turn back over to Matthew 27, 44, we know from here in Luke it says both thieves railed on him or both thieves, you know, jumped in with the crowd to accuse Jesus, to wag their head, however you want to describe that. But we know from, excuse me, it's Luke. Both thieves railed Matthew chapter 27. But if you look at the third gospel, Luke, so I've mentioned Mark to you, I'm telling you Matthew 27 says both thieves railed. I stated to you one repented because in Luke 23, verse, I'm going to go there. If you don't mind, let me read it to you real quickly. You don't have to turn there. Stay in Mark 15. It's verse 39. The Bible says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we, we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, and this is my point, what think ye of Christ? Some believe. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. Man, talk about two powerful words. Do you see belief in that? Yeah. Remember me. What was he saying? You're the Savior. You're innocent. You're dying for no reason, but you're God. Remember me when you come into the kingdom. When thou comest into thy kingdom. Prince of all the kings of the earth. Amen. He said, remember me. He didn't even have a chance to repent of all his sins. He was dying for all his sins. He just believed. And what was Jesus' statement to him? I know y'all know it. What did he say? Anyone want to volunteer? Today. Today, right? Y'all agree? Thou shalt be with me in paradise. He believed. Jesus gave him eternal life right before giving up the ghost. And then this man gave up the ghost and was with him. He's there today. That thief is there today. We'll meet him one day. Some believe, Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, church family, the great thing about preaching on the cross is you really can't preach it bad. I could have, I, I, perhaps I did fall on my face in my teaching this morning, but you and me, we all know when you get to the cross, it's so big, it's so high, it's so important, it's so glorious to us even to know that we have eternal life because God chose to go to the cross and we're compelled to share it with others. So as we look towards the end of the book of Mark here, the gospel, the good news of this man Mark who wrote underneath inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let it just be one more book in the Bible to compel us to be faithful to read it and to go share the story of the cross with others. Of course, we already know from Easter that Christ didn't stay dead. That's only part or half of the story, right? But thank God that he went to the cross, that he went up, as we say in Spanish, the Via Dolorosa, right? The, the way of suffering, all the way to the cross, and died there, shed his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or the taking away, the remitting of sins. But of course, Jesus' blood was shed for our sins, and he was innocent. And God gave us salvation by going to the cross. There were four different people that I see here. Maybe you can think of others. There are folks in this group here who have been reading the Bible as long as I've been alive. And anytime someone preaches the Scriptures, other Scriptures come to your mind because the Holy, your Holy Spirit taught. And I just challenge you this morning as we looked at the answer to that question, what think you of Christ? Some no doubt hate God. They hate Him. Some question don't give up on them. Continue to answer their questions with the Scripture. Some mock. Let us not be in the crowd. Let us separate ourselves from the crowd and be individual thinkers. Let us think upon the Scriptures and come up with our conclusions as the Holy Spirit teaches us. And then, of course, some believe. Let us reach others and bring them in that they might have eternal life also. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross and I thank you for the book of Mark and I thank you for our local church and we just thank you. You're good to us, and we just ask that you bless everything we do and say here today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless.